The Endless Step by Esther Hausig, Chapter 5 The first few weeks of life at the gypsum mine had passed and settled into a monotony that seemed as vast and endless as the step itself. Torn from sleep by the morning whistle, in the beginning I didn't know where I was, what we were all doing sleeping on a floor with strangers. But soon that too passed, and I would slip from sleep to wakefulness, barely noticing the difference. We did what we were told. We worked. We munched bread and cheese. Once in a while, as a special treat, we had a bowl of soup with bits of meat in it. We slept. We barely talked. The fever, or whatever it was I had, flared up, and I spent a few days alone in the room. Someplace Father had found a straw mattress, perhaps with Macrinan's help, and I lay on that for one day. The next day, when I was in a feverish doze, it was unceremoniously yanked out from underneath me. Pavraka had not learned to love us. A few nights later, he came in and told us to assemble for a meeting. What now? We gathered in front of Macarena's little building and waited. The air was very hot and still, and the sky was darkening too quickly. Way off in the distance, there was a flash of light. The crowd stirred. Before long, we would be in for it. There are those who find a Siberian electrical storm very beautiful and exciting, and I imagine it is as if one is not scared to death of it. I was, and so were most of the grown-ups in our midst, it seemed to me. In our Siberia, a summer storm was not a summer storm. It was the judgment of God, a God who would punish master and slave alike. The lightning would fork out like a malevolent claw in a frenzy to the ground itself on the treeless step. The fear was that where there was not a tree in sight, not a hill, it would ground itself in you if you were outdoors, and quite possibly if you were indoors too. There were times when the huge sky was streaked with lightning wherever you looked. This sky could be highly dramatic even when there was no storm brewing. At night I would stand at the window by the hour watching meteors race through the enormous blackness. There were also those dancing, shifting, awesomely beautiful columns of light, the northern lights, because on the steps and where they were at, there was no light pollution, no city lights to block anything. So you could imagine the, the stars just must have been awesome. When MacRinnan walked out, I hoped he would say his say quickly before the storm struck. He did. And to my 10-year-old ears, what he had to say was so unexpectedly exciting that I almost forgot the approaching storm. Every Sunday, six people would be allowed to go to the village. Permission would be granted by him, but must be requested well in advance. Back in our corner of the room, I hastened to assure my parents, before they might have other ideas, that unless I were allowed to go to the village immediately, I would die immediately. My poor mother, who was having one of her headaches and whose blistered feet had become so ulcerated that she had to work barefoot, muttered glumly that I was just like my father, always the optimist. Hadn't I learned by now that it was not all that easy to die? My grandmother thought that was a dreadful thing to say to a child, as I did, at which moment the storm broke outside, just in time to interrupt the one that was brewing inside. My father said that I could have his place, and since mother said she could not possibly go with her bad feet, grandmother hastily offered to go as my chaperone. My father suggested that Robust was not worth her trudging 12 kilometers, which by the way is about seven and a half miles, each way on a hot, dusty road. Grandmother, who had flitted about so gaily in Vilna from dinner party to dinner party to charity bazaars, theater and opera, ignored the insinuation that, that she too was starving for amusement. What do I care about hot, dusty roads? After all, what are grandmothers for? I think I would have been the same way because I'm kind of like that with my grandkids. You know, okay, yeah, come on, we'll do it. We'll find some trouble to get into. We received permission to go in two weeks. When we heard that Robust had a market, a barcholka, where one could exchange goods for rubles, rubles is the currency in Russia. So when you see that word rubles, it means money. And which was open on Sunday, it was agreed that grandmother and I should do some trading. 
Rubles meant food, potatoes, perhaps, anything but bread and brinza. We spent every night deciding which of our few belongings we were ready to sell. So I'm thinking they must not have too much left after the train trek of six weeks when they were giving their things to get food on the, at the train stations. One of Mother's lace-trimmed silk French silk slips went in and out of a bag a dozen times. I really don't need this for dynamiting gypsum, she said. By the way, uh, just as an aside on this, um, when we talked about women dynamiting, I was watching a show on um, imploding buildings in Las Vegas. And this is just within the last couple of years. And guess who was in charge of setting the dynamite into the holes to implode the building? Women. I thought that was interesting. But they did not have to drill the holes. Somebody else did that. <clears throat> Nor do I need this, Father said, holding up a custom-made silk shirt for driving a wagon. Grandmother wasn't so sure they wouldn't need them, and she herself was most reluctant to part with a black silk umbrella and a thin silver handle. If only we didn't have such nice things, she murmured. I wonder what she meant by that. Maybe it makes it harder to get rid of things. And what should I part with, I asked. Nothing. You are a growing child, they chorused. Indeed I was. In these two months, summer being growing time, my skirts had already become almost an inch shorter. I thought that Sunday would never come. When it did, Grandmother and I set off down the dusty road before anyone else, along with our wares. Wares are things that you're going to sell or buy. The slip, the shirt, the umbrella, after all. We had wrapped some bread in one of my father's handkerchiefs. The bread was to be our lunch. It was shortly after six o'clock. The air was still cool and fresh. A hawk was soaring overhead and feeling oddly disloyal. I thought that the step was just a tiny bit beautiful that morning. I glanced back over my shoulder. And again, she's the eternal optimist. No one was coming after us to order us to return to the mine. But I quickened my pace and urged grandmother to hurry. Nonsense, she said. We will drop dead if we walk too fast. But she, too, looked back over her shoulder. When the mine was out of sight, when there was nothing but grandmother and me in the step, nothing else, not even a hawk in the sky, I didn't shout. I wouldn't dare because of the way the sound carried. I didn't sing very loud, but I sang, and my funny little voice sounded strange to me. And I felt light, as if I could do a giant leap over the steps. Grandmother, do you know what? What? We are doing something we want to do all by ourselves. We are free. Shh. Grandmother looked around. Not so loud. She was dressed in her best dress, a rumpled blue silk that was also beginning to fade, and her little garbo hat. In spite of her tininess, Grandmother had always been the grand dame walking down the dusty road that day. She still was. Look up garbo hat when you get chances, is they're interesting hats. We walked for about three hours across the uninhabited steppe without meeting one other person. Before long, I had tied my sweater around my waist. My pleated school skirt and blouse had become my uniform. And Grandmother had opened her umbrella. We saw a bump in the distance. This turned out to be the first of the widely scattered huts which meant that before too long, we would be in rebuffs. The village had appeared on the horizon, like a mirage, always receding from us. But we finally did reach it, and it was real, wonderfully real to my starved eyes. Rebuffs at that time had an unused church with an, its onion top, which is typical of Russian Orthodox churches, but with the advent of communism in the 19-teens and the 20s, and now it's in the 1940s, um, communism outlawed any state religion. So if you practice a religion, you did it in secret because there's no religious part of communism. A bank, a library, a pharmacy, a school, even a movie house and a park with a bandstand. But all I saw that day was a square alive with people and only vaguely 
a rather mean cluster of wooden buildings and huts. So a town square is like they build it like this. In a, well, I guess I should go like this. In a square. And all the buildings surround the center. That's probably where the bandstand was, I'm betting, because it would be a gathering place. We squeezed our way through the crowd. The men in peaked caps here and there. An old military cap. Women in babushkas. Friendly faces, sometimes scattered, from, scarred from frostbite. Friendly waves. The women, <laughs> and some Kazakhs. Asia at last. Colorful costumes. The women with their long pigtails encased in cloth and leather pouches. And, sad to see, some men, women, and children, all with rotting teeth. But Kazakhs. So that would might be in what was is now Kazakhstan. I don't know. There's been so many countries that have cropped up over the 100 and 120 years. I, I don't know. Might be worth looking into. Trading was going on all around us. There were the stalls around the square with produce from the collective farms because in communism, no farmer worked for themselves. They worked for the government. Everybody shared the profits evenly. That was the theory anyway. The small farmers too. There were the buildings with signs proclaiming them to be state-operated stores where one made purchases only if one had been issued ration books. And I think we talked about that one day with the word ration. Um, so many things were rationed, even in the United States at that time, that you got a book with coupons and you would be allotted so much per month of certain things. Which we had not, we had not been. So they didn't have ration books. They could not buy anything at the state store. In one corner, sunflower seeds were being roasted over an open fire. The smell was ravishing. Come on, grandmother, I nudged her. Let's begin to trade. We made our way to the barcholka, where wooden horses were set up all over the interior of the square, and where piles of stuff were heaped onto blankets or onto bare stones. Old boots, jackets, babushkas, books, pots, pans, anything and everything. So kind of like a flea market. We found a place to stand, and to my surprise, without feeling the least bit self-conscious, I immediately held up my mother's slip, the lacy pink silk blowing in the breeze. In a second, we were surrounded. Where were we from? Where did we live? What did grandmother do? How old was I? They were exceedingly friendly and, frankly, inquisitive, those native Siberians. We answered the questions as fast as we could, with Grandmother doing most of the talking since she knew Russian well. There's another clue about Grandma. Not only did she know Polish, she knew Russian. And I hardly spoke it. Oh, but Esther did a little bit, too. We coaxed our potential customers to note the beauty of the lace, the fact that there were 16. 16! ribs in the umbrella how much 40 rubles 40 rubles there was a roar of laughter all right 38 rubles i caught grandmother's eye and we smiled at each other we were born traders and we were having a marvelous time so they were dickering with the price and sometimes at flea markets you can do that you could say well i don't want to i'll give you this much and see what they say it was in fact the happiest time i had had in a long long time the guns, the bombs of World War II were thousands of miles away, and at the marketplace, so was the labor camp close by. All around me, children were giggling over nothing. Girls were showing off their dolls. What if they were made of rags? The boys were wrestling. The children were just like the children in Vilna. Hunger, fatigue, sorrow, and fright were forgotten. Haggling was a wonderful engrossing game. Rough hands that had scrounged the earth for potatoes had been frostbitten more than once, fingered the silk, sometimes as if it were a rosary, which is a religious object used by certain um, Christian religions. Sometimes as if it were sinful for anything to be that silky, more often to test it for durability. If an egg was around 15 rubles, how much should a silk slip with hand-drawn lace be? Hand-drawn, mule-drawn. What difference if you couldn't eat it? We all joined in the laughter. I don't remember who bought father's shirt and grandmother's umbrella, but the slip was finally bought by a young woman with lots of orange rouge on her cheeks. She was so plump, I wondered how she was going to squeeze into it. 
But that, I decided, was her worry and not mine. Feeling very proud of ourselves with our newly acquired rubles, we now became the customers. What to buy? We went to the stalls where the produce was, watermelons, cucumbers, potatoes, milk, flour, white bread, a great luxury, and meat. Everything was incredibly expensive, and we walked back and forth from stall to stall, unable to make a decision. I stood perfectly still in front of the roasting sunflower seeds, ostentatiously breathing in and out. So she was kind of going, mm. Grandmother counted the rubles we had. Come, she said, what are grandmothers for? The first purchase was a small glass full of sunflower seeds. I slit the shell between my teeth and extracted the tiny nut. I nursed it as if it were a piece of precious candy and it could not have tasted better. Siberians love sunflower seeds and I think 90% of them had a little notch in a front tooth to prove it. After much deliberation and more bargaining, we bought a piece of meat and a bag of flour. There was a communal outdoor stove at the schoolhouse and we could boil the meat on it and after mixing the flour with water, we could bake little cakes, the Siberian cakes of our disapora. By the time the sun had begun to set, Grandmother said we must start our long hike home, but I could tell she was as reluctant to leave this carnival as I was. So it seemed was everyone else. The stalls were empty of their produce, like some kind of game. Everyone had everyone else's belongings, wrapped in blankets, coats, babushkas, old flower sacks. But having come together in this vast, lonely steppe, having joked and gossiped and even sung songs, no one wanted to leave. However, as we began our long trudge back, we were very gay, thinking only of the Barcholka, not of the mine. Grandmother and I had this in common. We were very people, either very sad or very gay, with nothing in between. Oh, if we could only live in the village and go to the Barcholka every Sunday, Siberia would be bearable. I started to tick off the things I had to sell. Three dresses, one blouse, a coat. Grandmother laughed. Stop before you go naked in exchange for a glass of sunflower seeds. No matter, I thought, whether I had something to sell or not, I would pray that one day we would be allowed to live in the village within the so sight and sound of the Sunday Barcholka.